Looking at the highest value stocks in the US in terms of market capitalization, if one were to have invested in an equal weighted portfolio of the top 10 largest stocks at the start of the year, you would have basically crushed commonly used benchmarks like the S&P 500. So you might ask, why wouldn't I just stick to investing in the top 10 largest stocks? These are among the most profitable companies in the world. Many have dominant positions in their industries and the largest 10 stocks have grown so large now to represent more than a third of the total market capitalization of the S&P 500. So I wanted to see how a simple strategy that picks the top 10 largest companies every year would have performed historically. And I managed to backtest this strategy all the way back to 1995. Notice that for some years, we need to look at stock prices for companies that are no longer listed on any exchange. And I will tell you more about how I made this backtest with more details later in the video. Here's how my top 10 backtest performed since 1995. We can calculate the annualized return and volatility since the start of my back test. But just looking at the point to point return of these two time series doesn't really tell you that much since results would have been different if we started the analysis here or here. So instead, we should look at so called rolling returns. Rolling returns means that every day in our back test, we measured the return after let's say three years. This plot shows you the annualized return three years after your initial investments for both the top 10 and the S&P 500. Calculate the average rolling return, we can see that the top 10 actually underperforms. The average return of the top 10 is only higher than the S&P 500 when looking at a one year holding period. If one looks at the average return after three or five years, the top 10 portfolio underperforms. And we can also plot the difference in three year annualized return between our top 10 index and the S&P 500 to notice something interesting. The most recent three year output performance of the top 10 is within the 5 percentile of our historical data, meaning that more than 95% of the time, the outperformance has been lower or negative. You can see this as well when you're splitting the performance in half decades, so in increments of five years. The outperformance of the top 10 seen so far during the current decade looks ominously similar to the outperformance seen just before the dot-com bubble. Now, I'm not going to say we're in a bubble because this number looks similar to that number, etc, etc. Actually, looking at pricing multiples for the top 10 stocks, today's levels are not as high as during the dot com bubble. But the main reason I don't like the strategy of just investing in the top 10 largest stocks is that it is never a static list. In fact, going back all the way to 1995, there is only one company that exists in the 1995 list and today's list, and that is Microsoft. Just like Intel, for example. So Intel that manufactures and design chips mainly used in PCs and servers were at one point one of the most highly valued company in the world. Then it started to fall behind rivals in Asia like TSMC and Samsung. And Intel also failed to see how AI would lead to demand for chips mainly designed by Nvidia, leading to a lower stock price over time. And now it might even be a takeover target. So just because some stocks are valued highly by the market, and doesn't mean that that's going to happen in the future as well. Picking just the 10 most valued stocks, you will be more exposed to sectors that the market finds valuable at the time. And you will not have exposure either to the rising stars that might be destined to replace those top 10 stocks in the future. So the S&P 500 and other broader market indices might be a better bet because they will pick the winners and lower the allocation to the laggers in a more diversified way. You will have more stocks from different sectors, not just the top 10. Now, if you think that this time is different and you believe that the top 10 will continue to dominate markets going forward, actually picking them manually might not be optimal either. Every time you rebalance and you need to replace one stock with the other, you have to pay capital gains tax on those realized gains. And it might also be difficult to keep track on which stocks is the largest one as well. And an ETF can do that for you. Now, there are no ETFs tracking the top 10 that I could find, but there are one from Invesco that tracks the top 50. Now, the management fee for this top 50 ETF is higher than ETFs that tracks an index like the S&P 500. So keep that in mind. So now I'm going to share some details of behind the scenes of this backtest. So first, uh, how did I get the market capitalizations for all of these stocks? So I mostly use the Fortune 500 list, but for recent years, you can use other data sources as well. 
you don't have to stick to that one. Market cap data are as of 31st of March every year. And I assume I can rebalance the month after. So on the last day of April, I will buy and sell stocks based on the top 10 list. So that's how I looked up my investment universe. These are all the companies that I need to buy. How do I guess the daily close prices for all of these stocks? So my main source is Yahoo Finance. Now, if you're going back all the way to 1995 to see these top 10 stocks, you will see companies that no longer exist, meaning you can no longer buy or sell them on an exchange and Yahoo Finance will no longer publish any prices. How do you get access to historical prices for those types of stocks? Now you could pay for that data, but most providers that I saw either had around 10 or 20 years worth of data but I needed more than that because I needed all the way back to 1995 and since I just needed a few stocks I didn't want to pay for all of that so I needed to find another way what about a time machine yes so the Wayback Machine is a website that acts a bit like a, an archive for internet pages. Using the Wayback Machine, I can look up old versions of Yahoo Finance. And on those old pages, I can enter my tickers for these old companies to get pages of historical data. For example, here are the daily closes that I found for Lucent Technologies for the relevant period that I'm interested in. But notice that we have some gaps here. I could not find the pages containing the data for these specific days. So what do you do? Like, do you draw a line between the last available price and the next available price? Now, a better way, in my opinion, is to look how Lucet Technologies moves in relation to something that you can observe during this period, like the NASDAQ, for example. Then we use that model to fill in the gaps where there are no published values for Lucent Technologies. And when I say published values, that means that I cannot access it historically. If you, if you were standing here uh, back in the day and entered on Yahoo Finance, you can search it easily. But it's just me using the Wayback Machine. I cannot get access to those daily prices. With this interpolation using the NASDAQ, you're not going to be exactly historically accurate, but in my opinion, it's a good enough proxy for when you have like just a few days gap uh, of missing prices. If you don't have any prices at all, th that will be a different issue. So keep that in mind. There are some gaps that I'm using this linear approximation for certain stocks that no longer exist. So there you have it. That's my back test. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed watching the video, please make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already done so to support the channel.